So the original um, the original class was actually actually going to be looking at um, the early Bronze Age, uh, the likes of the Beaker people, but I had to change that because um, about ten days ago, uh, one of our members in Bridgen class passed away, and he was a professor of botany at Reading University, and um, occasionally I, I would do the odd classes um, that involved what we can understand from plants, um, what we can understand from trees associated with archaeology, um, what some plants tell us um, about landscapes that were once uh, farmed or mined, uh, moreover in this valley, um, and other um, various activities. And one thing that really interests me um, is the idea of an ancient woodland. Now, if anyone tells me that they know of an ancient woodland a lot, uh, in this valley, right, they're a damn right liar. Um, well, I'm hoping they're a damn right liar. 99% um, of the original tree cover in this valley uh, was completely stripped. There might be one or two old trees, and that's it. Um, pit props and all the rest of it, that's life. Glyn? Where's that? <coughs> on the other side of the valley where... Uh, on the left hand side. Used to live. Yeah. yeah. Run, yeah. So As I said, 99%, yeah. so I covered myself there. Um, signs of an old woodland, to see if it's an ancient woodland, um, are based upon about 16... Um, on plant species, maybe a bit more than that actually. And when we talk about plant species, we're talking about one of them uh, being dog's mercury and this one being herb paris. Now herb paris is a very interesting one. Um, it's got a high toxicity. Uh, you eat too many of its berries, it'll kill you. Um, and it's got, um, to identify it, it's got four leaves. Um, usually yellow or green petals and it's um, it flowers between May and June and it's identifiable in ancient woodlands um, and the berries are available from June to October and they're not to be eaten and what do we know about Herb Paris there's Herb Paris there uh, have you identified that in your ancient woodland, John? Have I come across that? You may have, if it's a truly ancient woodland. But it might not be in that woodland. But there might be um, a number of the other species in there to actually tell you it's an ancient woodland. This, um, this prefers to grow in dappled shade of deciduous woodland. Um, conifers are usually a sign of planted woodland, um, the likes of the larch, uh, the likes of any other species that looks like the Scots pine, it's likely to have been planted by human beings. Uh, there was a stage 100, 150 years ago um, that it was government policy that uh, as many tracts of the British landscape were, were to be planted with trees to be used in the mining industry. And 250 years before that, 300 years before that, oak trees were being planted, just oak woodlands, for the construction of the British Navy. Do you know why they plant black? Tell me why. Because they lose their leaves in the autumn and they break the wheat, so they can plant the greenest. Oh, right. Interesting. All the forests you see, you go around now, yeah. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Um, there is talking one thing. Um, I, I went up to Castle Nos on the um, at the head of the Ronde Vach Valley. I told somebody the Ronde Vach Valley the other day. They didn't like it. It's the Ronde Vach, but Bach and Vach means the same thing. Anyway, I went to the top of that valley and there's all planted forests, um, and they're all dead. 
the entire forest is dead, absolutely dead. Um, and there's an interesting point to be made there. Um, even in the past, there may have been diseases that wiped out woodlands and forests. Nothing to do with human beings. Everything that I'm doing today is on the presumption that um, if a woodland has disappeared, it's because it's been cut down by human beings. Okay, That may not always be the case. But in most cases, um, that is basically what's going on. And there is one thing, right? Never when you're ever talking to me about forests, do you refer to forests containing deciduous trees. Because if it's got deciduous trees, like the elm or the oak, it's a woodland. And if it's got cot's pine, it's a forest. That's the difference. When people talk about the new forest, it's not a forest at all, it's a woodland. That really gets on my nerves. And it's the same as people calling my children kids. Oh. Uh, yeah, that's, that's dangerous. Okay. I, I, there's an organisation in the Rondo, St. Penicline, and the name they've got is Valley Kids. No. And I keep on saying, how are the goats getting on? Exactly. I, I, it really annoys me. I mean, it really does. They try to me. I've made myself quite unpopular with them. Uh, in fact, we have a lady who comes to church and she doesn't like it at all what I say. I know, but... Kids, valley Kids. It's they're not. Kids. Exactly. You That's know. the same thing about woodlands and forests. I've anyway, never, I've never heard that one before. That's that's a new one. Yeah, no, it's 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 the thing is if it's if it's um, trees that shed their leaves in the winter, then it's a woodland. If they keep their leaves all year round, then it's a forest. That that's the way to work it out. Okay, go on. Not at the old page where it's like if you count the number of species under the species. That's right. That is a good one, but it's still not an ancient hedgerow. It's only ancient it's been, if it's been planted by man. That's another thing with me. Right? A lot of places, they clear the land, but they put leave of wind right? Sometimes, yes. Sometimes. Anyway, let's move on with this. I just noticed something about this herb Paris, which I knew anyway. Herb Paris only glow, uh, grows in areas where the ground underneath is limestone. And that wouldn't be limestone up there, would it? It'd be sandstone. Yeah. So you might not find her Paris in that woodland up there if it's an ancient woodland. That's an important thing. Some of the leaves on, on there, then, yeah. from here, look as if they were Japanese not we are. They do, but they're not. They're certainly not. They're certainly not. So it, it, that her Paris? That's her Paris. It grows no more than about um, yeah, but what is that it? high. Is it a no, it's not a hurt. Well, it, we'll talk about that in a short while, okay? We're running ahead of ourselves. But it, it likes to grow in dappled areas, um, in neutral and acidic soils. That's her Paris. A bit more about it. Um, it's, it's a nice, it says a whorl of leaves, four leaves. They're, they're slightly oval. Um, and there are the wonderful um, berries. And the berries themselves are available for um, uh, four months of the year. And it says that the plant grows in ancient woodland. We've already uh, associate, seen that. Um, on moist but not uh, soggy basic soils. So sort of in dappled shade with, under trees. Um, the blackberries um, create a red dye. Um, this can be extracted. Um, and the red dye... Um, to, then can turn to a violet colour when you add some citric acid. Um, and then the leaves themselves can also be used to create a dye. Um, it's, it's, it spreads through the ground system uh, by the rhizomes. Um, it can be used um, as a herb or medicinally, um, but its toxicity... Um, and the fact that if you eat too many berries, it'll kill you, um, is something today that's slightly avoided. Um, this is another one, dog's mercury. This might be um, a popular one. It's, it's slightly toxic, and that's dog's mercury. It spreads a, a creeping carpet throughout these uh, woodlands and forests. There's an interesting point to be made again, that um, 
if you ever see one species of tree in a woodland or, a, or, or in a forest, it means that that's been planted by man. If you ever see one species of a ground plant, it means that at one time it's likely that the um, woodland has been cleared. No matter how old the trees are, it's been cleared. Because what happens is one or two species survives, not all of them. Um, and then those species become dominant. So this is, uh, this is known as dog's mercury. Um, it creeps through uh, fairly um, sometimes cleared landscapes. Um, but if it's found alongside other plant species, um, then it's a sign of ancient woodland. So dog's mercury itself thrives in deciduous woods um, um, on clay soils. So slightly different from the, um, the herb Paris. Rhizomes spreads um, through the earth. Um, and it's, um, it's said it is more poisonous than its only other relatives. So it is poisonous. Um, and it, it goes on to say it can be used as a dye and all the rest of it. But the point with these, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, um, is that... I'm looking at indicators of ancient woodland and human activity. So if you see it as a single species in a woodland, it means that a woodland at some time has been cleared, right? Because there's only one species left. Um, if you see it amongst herb Paris um, and other species, it's an indicator of an ancient woodland. So it hasn't been cleared by human beings. If you see it out in the middle of nowhere, right, on a hillside or in a field... It means at one point there was woodland there, not so long ago, and this is all that's left of the woodland. Dog's mercury on the ground. Now this is a popular one. When we say lords and ladies, what are we talking about, John? Ever heard of that one? Well, now, lords and ladies is also a sign of an ancient woodland if it's to be found alongside other plants. But where the landscape's being cleared um, and trees have come back and you, you just have these dominant, then obviously um, the woodland that you're looking at isn't ancient. There it is. Have you seen that before? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's various, various names for this. Um, going back to the names, it's known as Cuckoo Pint. Jack in the Pole put on Naked Boys. So that's Jack in his pulpit. Okay? Or Cuckoo Pint. Um, there are other names associated with it. And it basically says, the opposite side of the pulpit, Jack is inside giving his sermon to the congregation. So it looks like a pulpit. So Jack, Jack in the pulpit, he's doing his sermon. Um, so this itself um, is one of those species that comes in comes in again when the ancient woodland has been cleared. And if we move on a little bit further, it is toxic. You wouldn't want to eat this. Um, and it's always best in Mother Nature to avoid leaves that are glossy. Um, and it's always good to avoid this. It's known as um, the arum. Um, it, and it's... Um, and it goes on to say, you can get starch from it, right? Um, but I, I, I love reading this paragraph here. And it says, uh, starch extracted from the root was formerly used for starch in laundry. Great. But it contains the same acute irritant as do, does the acrid juice contained in all parts of the plant. So its use in this context was abandoned. So in other words, whenever you used it in starching clothes, when, whenever you wore those clothes, you'd, you'd, be, you'd come up in a rash. Um, it's also, if you, if you prepare it in the right way, it can be used in the baking process. But if you use too much of it, it can also poison you. When, the, go on. When glossy indeed, the can be used as bay. Bay But usually they're to be avoided. <laughs> yeah, bay, exactly. The attractive red berries are the most poisonous parts of this plant. 
but fatalities are rare due to the burning sensation in the mouth when mm. the berries are eaten. So if you put, if you start, if your mouth starts to burn, then obviously you're not to swallow because it'll kill you. We're going to talk about you, you berries in a minute. Uh, this is followed by swelling by the tongue, salvation, strong convuls um, convulsions, nausea, bloody vomiting, and severe gastroenteritis, followed by death. It's not a bad one, is it? Um, you berries, right? I, 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 I remember taking a group of people to a church graveyard not so long ago, right? And one bright spark started thinking, oh, you can eat these berries. And I'm thinking, no, please don't. So he says, okay, you, you, you can eat these berries and spit the pip out, right? But one other person had started crunching into this, you, berry. Um, and we, I, I got the person pronto to the car, sort of um, trying to copiously spit whatever they've had out, and they were okay. Um, but never listen to people when they say you eat red berries. You can eat the berry, but not the pip. If you eat the, if you eat the seed, the pip, right? It, it, it can kill you. Cows. 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 Trees, yeah, that's right. Cows. Yeah. Exactly. Apple pips. Arsenic and apple pips. Yeah, you're right. You you're right. <laughs> apple pips. Yeah, you know, it's nothing wrong with the old apple. Oh, it's not. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking of almond then. The next one, foxglove. Uh, we are all familiar with the foxglove, aren't we? We're all familiar with the foxglove. Um, foxgloves are a sign that the woodland was cleared a long time ago and grows amongst bracken, right? So the foxgloves come up um, and they're to be seen in sort of fairly disturbed landscapes, but it's a native species as well, yeah? So if you get foxgloves um, alongside dogs, mercury and some bluebells um, and... Um, and enemies and all the rest of it, all together, nice happily in a woodland, right? Uh, chuck a bit of wild garlic in there, right? You've got a really ancient woodland. But what foxgloves like to do, they, they, they like to sort of move into an area that's been felled with trees, um, amongst the bracken and stuff. And what they do, before the bracken leaves get really high, they just poke themselves through. Um, a typical rhizomic plant, a bit like horsetail fern. Um, and it's, it's a bit of an invasive species. I know one of you mentioned um, uh, the likes of Japanese knotweed, but Japanese knotweed isn't native to this country. Foxglove is. Okay. Um, a grove of foxglove, the mist bracken, a frequent occurrence on slopes of acid moorland mountain. And it's like, in most cases, that acid moorland itself uh, was once full of trees. But now, because of all the acidity of the rotting plants and all the rest of it, the bracken moves in, and then the foxgloves' rhizomic um, um, root systems are taking over. And I'm still waiting for my cup of tea, but we'll have to wait till the break. There's our wonderful foxglove. See, you've ruined my life. You know, you're absolutely useless, Brian. No, uh, by the way, that. because this is being recorded, you can use this to sue me in court. Um, yeah, and the heating. All right then, all right then. The bluebell. Now we're all familiar with the bluebell, aren't we? Yeah. But um, one thing that can be said about uh, how many times have you? I, I used to. Um, um, I used to have um, a woman that I used to um, frequent with um, in Sussex. Um, and um, we used to go for I, I, we used to go for walking walks in Bluebell Woods um, with our children, so there was nothing going on. Um, and it always used to, I, I really got myself in a hole, and then I didn't even have yeah, to mention yeah. that, right? How can you have children without something going on? Oh, shut up! Right, anyway. Um, no, the point is, we used to go to Bluebell Woods, and they were always, also, always described as ancient. You've heard of ancient Bluebell Woods. It's, but whenever you go to these Bluebell Woods, it's full of these Bluebells, but the trees themselves are always young trees. They're always birch trees, 
or all these oak trees and that's it, right? And what's happened is the landscape was completely tree, uh, cleared, right? And if you look in the likes of Sussex, bluebells sort of like areas of, of mining, right? Because in that area of Sussex, um, it was a, um, an iron mining area, right? And some areas of the Vale of Morgan in this landscape, right? You get bluebell woods. And what's usually happening sort of south of here or whatever? Mining as well, you know? Lead or iron. We did, did that last week. And if you go into these woodlands and it says ancient, they're not ancient. Because if it's just got bluebells, um, the fact of the matter is the bluebells are really nice. Um, but they, they've come in later on, okay? They've come in um, as the trees are rejuvenating and are regrowing, okay? And the bluebells have just taken over the entire landscape, okay? And that's a bluebell woodland. <coughs> Glee Coral. Up there, up there. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see, actually. You, you, know, you know what I said, right? You know what I said? Um, I don't like be, to be dismissive of things, right? And, and I, we, we mentioned about a bit about the herb Paris, and I, and I actually realised then herb Paris isn't going to grow over there because it's um, it's sandstone. But you might have one or two herb Paris. If you've got one or two herb Paris, few anemones, you know, the, the white little flowers, a few bluebells, chuck a couple of bit foxgloves on the outside, and all the rest of it. You've got a nice variety, then we've got an ancient woodland. But what may have happened in there, you might have some old trees, okay, but on the outside it's all been cleared, okay? So I'm not dismissing anything. It's very careful at the beginning when I said 99% of the valley has had its uh, trees cleared, because there's got to be one or two trees that are old, okay? Didn't want to be dismissive there. Mainly the oak trees, I think they're set, you know, they're set, yeah, set Seasal oak, yeah, I like that, yeah. yeah. Uh, so they're growing really, they're growing really powerfully tall, yeah? Yeah, yeah sesal oak, yeah. Sesal oak grows really tall. The pendunculate oak grows a bit sort of gnarly and all the rest of it. Yeah, good. Good identification there, I like it. A few birch there as well, maybe? Thinking? Well, I've been here for 30 years now, so... <laughs> No, Wait, get yourself over there and let us know like, next yeah, week. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of different trees in there anyway. That's what I like to hear, good. Yeah. Variety. I mean, it's, it's also as well, and all the trees are coming to the end of their lives as well. Yes. The big ones are, are, are coming down because of it. Yeah. And they went. Same as in, in Michigan Skull Camp. Yeah. We've got trees there, now they're coming down, and we're all going, ooh, what are we going to do? But we had the fella then, he said, you know, after 100 years or 200 years, trees die. Yeah. And, and that's what's happening. So we are now replanting similar trees. But isn't Mother Nature replanting them ourselves? Uh, that, that's, the, that's the big question. Not really. Um, no. There are some, but, but, but uh, we're taking, I'm taking a lot of them. Um, can, I, can, I can I just mention something, right? I, I want to I take what you've just said aside, right? Um... And I, I want us to dive into another point, which I was going to do a bit later, but I'll put it in the end there. Right. I was listening to a radio interview very recently on BBC Radio 4, I think it was. And it, there was a group of people who would just written books. And there was uh, this one person, this one woman that knew it all, right? And there was this guy, he was a woodland farmer, right? And he'd, he'd written this book, right? How to Manage Woodlands. Um, how to manage ancient woodland, right? And this woman was gonna, this woman was gonna go for a jugular straight away. You could see it happening, right? So he was saying, um, my woodlands, right? Um, some are really old woodlands, and he's saying what I'm saying. If it's ancient, all these different species, right? To keep that biology, to keep that flora and fauna in check, right? To, to make it act like an ancient woodland, good point for you, Brian, with your trees and stuff, right? I bet you there's a lot of bracken in your woodland, but keep it there. Um, he said, what I do, I graze pigs and I graze, graze cattle in the woodland, right? And she went for him. She said, ah, that's a joke, that is. Uh, it can't be an ancient woodland because uh, ancient woodlands wouldn't have had pigs and, and cattle grazing through them. 
she she was having a right go with him, and then I was actually on her side for a second, right? And then it was his time to talk, right? So he was a typical person who knew what she was going to say, right? He said, actually, before humans got their own way with the woodlands and forests of this landscape, there were big cows that naturally roamed through these woodlands called Oroch. They would trample everything down. Their dung would go on the floor, right? They would move on. All these flowers that I've mentioned, now me, right, and then he mentioned in a program, would, would grow and flourish. There'd be mosses and fungi everywhere, right? And then those trees um, would rejuvenate. And he said the pigs would root around, right, and everything would be mucked around with, right? And the red squirrels would come in and bury their nuts and all these other things. And the wild pigs everywhere. Yeah, and the, the fact of the matter is why she didn't say anything after that, because he was dead right. He said, my woodlands can be seen as an ancient woodland, acting like an ancient woodland, because this is what would have happened in nature, right? And actually, I think I think she put a foot in it by saying, um, oh, I, I, bought a, I bought a woodland off the internet, right? Yeah? Mm -hmm. It's an ancient woodland. And he said... Um, he then shot her down again, right? This isn't a male-female thing, right? It's just it's a stupid person there, right? Whether it's male or female. And, and he said, um, he said, what you got growing in your woods? He said, oh, I've got really, she said, I've got really ancient trees. He said, no, what you got growing in your woods? What's on the ground? She said, oh, it's just full of nettles and brambles. And he said, um, that's not going to be ancient for long, is it? Because none of the trees... Are rejuvenating because the ground cover is all nettles and brambles. He said, "Have you got any? Um, have you got any dog's mercury down?" She said, "No, we don't. We can't seem to get it to grow." And that was the point. That was the point he was making. If you got pigs and deer um, and you got badgers in there and all the rest of it, right? They will dig everything up, churn everything up, and all these varieties will grow. He's the one that was right, and he's written a book on it. Yeah. So if, if you if you if you want to get things right, you've got to have all those checks and balances. You really have. I not going back to your woodland, right? If you've got a farmer who's able to graze some of his um, cows in the woodland, right? It'd be brilliant. You'd have all these wonderful species in there. You have one or two trees rejuvenating as well. That's the point. We'll leave it there. But anyway, um, bluebells now. Oh, let's just do a bit of non-archaeology, but it's important. Lots of bluebell woods have these Spanish bluebells. So that's not a sign of ancient woodland at all by any stroke of the imagination. Spanish bluebells, um, unlike the Spanish bluebells, our bluebells are narrower down the length, like these ones here. Um, and do not flare out until the very end. So Spanish ones go flare out much sooner. Um, and they're usually um, either um, a pinkier colour um, or an off colour, okay? Um, and at the, at the back here, what we've got, we've got um, what's um, called the uh, brats peeling away at the base, okay? And those are basically the difference between the Spanish and our ones. And it also says... The six petals recurve back upon themselves, um, and um, and that's basically our ones. So we've got a lot to check out in our woodland, Brian and John. Um, we like wild garlic. Okay. Now that woodland that you got down there would have wild garlic, right? I know that I know that for a fact, right? Um, it, it comes into flower in April, May, and June, and all of the wild garlic can be eaten, every single bit of it. Okay? You take it home. Um, don't make the mistake I made once, right? Michael, a bit about your dating days, right? If a woman ever takes you to Castle Cork, right, and there's all this wild garlic growing, and you jump out the car and you say, oh, wow, I'll go, I'll go get a bouquet of those um, flowers for her now, right? Check that you can smell. Um, 
because it was one of those days I did it. I thought, oh, wow, these are beautiful flowers going around here. Castle Koch, right, that's all they got there is, is, is um, I don't know if it's a larch or a pine or some conifer, I can't remember where it is. They're all going around Castle Koch, so it's completely artificial forest. But on the ground itself, there's loads of these ransoms, wild garlic growing, which grows in a massively disturbed area where, 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 where it's been massively disturbed. Um, and I gave her these bouquet of flowers. We didn't go on a second date. She complained later by text that her car stank of garlic for weeks. I had, I had a block nose. <laughs> Strangely enough, she wanted to leave soon after that. All these anecdotal stories are true, I, 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 but they look beautiful. They really, really did. They really, really did. Um, and it, oh, and this is a nice one. Um, hedgerows, you know, disturbed hedgerows. They usually grow in hedgerows um, and in disturbed areas. But again, if you find one or two of them, just one or two alongside the other varieties that we've mentioned, then again, it's a sign of ancient woodland. It's wherever you get large cluster of, clusters of anything that indicates an artificial landscape. Um, it's like anything in nature. Um, you get a, you get a pack of rats growing underneath this, this building. That's all you've got is rats. You've got no mice, whatever. Artificial landscape. You've just got grey squirrels in the woodland. Nothing else. Artificial landscape. Um, only um, I've seen a woodland in Barry, right? That's just got yew trees, right? But it's an artificial woodland. Yew tree may be an ancient tree, right? There are 36 varieties of British trees, but if you see just one variety, ancient woodland. Have any of you ever been to a sycamore woodland? I have. Yeah. And I'll, I'll. What was your impression of a sycamore woodland? When I used to work in forest tree cutting, there was a lot of um, trees that were Ash, beech, and sycamore. What did you feel about the sycamores? I'm just talking about a sycamore woodland. Well, we just used to cut it, but within a year, you'd have a, a meter shoot. Every stuff. The, the point I'm trying to make is a sycamore woodland is that nothing grows underneath it. It's a, it's a horrible landscape. I don't like sycamore trees. No. Sycamores are not native to this country. Um, if ever you see a sycamore amongst... Um, a woodland or a forest or a few of them, it means that that woodland is not an ancient woodland. Sycamores don't like to grow alongside our species unless we plant them, okay? Um, so sycamores are a sign that you don't have an ancient woodland. Um, there's um, you know, massive signs of ancient woodlands. Not only do you get five, 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 start again. Not only do you get four layers of flora in a woodland if you've got big massive boulders amongst the flowers and the trees you know huge massive boulders right that is your really ancient ancient woodland not only well the fact of the matter is most of our woodlands and landscapes along around the landscape right would have had boulders in amongst them boulder woods Okay, and in that the trees grow. They're left because of the last glaciation. If you find really old trees and there's no boulders around, right? It might be that they are old trees, um, but the boulders have been cleared, and there's been agriculture. Then these old um, trees were planted in the Roman period or in the medieval period. It's still old, but it's not um, a truly native landscape. Um, at that point, what I'm going to do is we're going to have we're going to have um, we're going to have a little break. But I want to tell you this. I want to tell you this. Uh, don't get up yet. This ain't a race, okay? Now this is a lovely book my grandmother bought me. Right, she's hundred now, bless her soul, okay? Um, and alongside the boulders, to find an ancient woodland. You need to see nice mosses growing along the trunks of trees and mosses on some, some boulders. You've got your funguses and your, and your uh, mushrooms growing at the lowest layer. 
not just one or two varieties, but a load. And magic mushrooms are a good sign as well. You would know all about that, John, wouldn't you? The second layer, right? The second layer um, is all those different plants that we've mentioned. Wood anemones, sweet violet, that's a nice one. Wood sorrel. You've got the, your likes of your um, dog's mercury and the odd bluebells. That's your second layer, known as your field layer. Then you've got a third layer on top of that, known as your shrub layer, which contains your smaller trees, like your midland hawthorn, your service tree, hazel, bramble, ivy and holly. That's your shrub layer. And above that, you've got the big beasts. You've got the elm, the ash, the beech, the aspen. If you've got all those layers, you've got a true ancient woodland. So boulders, flora next, ground layer of your mosses and so on, feed layer, field layer of your wood anemones, for example, shrub layer with your hazels, and your fourth, but last but not least, your beaches. Throw in that fourth layer. Indications of ancient woodland. So what we're going to do now, the drugs don't work, we're going to have a break. Just for five minutes. Any questions, boys? They used to grow a lot of beets on the Isle of Wight with the charcoal. It's charcoal burn this yes. the beach on the Isle of Wight has got a black fungus. So it's no good for grimsha or anything. Ah, the black fungus. Like it. It comes inside the wood. Black fungus. Yeah. It's nice. I, I, I know it's I know I know it damages the trees quite considerably, but yeah, black fungus exactly. Uh, so what we'll do, we'll take a break. Come on, folks, get on with it. Cal should be on. Move it. You, you all. Oh you all, Dame. He's he's he's. <laughs> right, back to this. Is it me or is the light in you absolute crap? Yeah. Right, there you go. There's the ransoms as well. Um, and there they are again. The leaves smell of garlic when crushed. For large gatherings of plants, the smell of garlic wafts con a considerable distance. The, f the problem is with having plants like this in a woodland. If you've ever been through a garlic, if you've ever been through a woodland covered in garlic, you just fall over, right? And again, that's another indication that where you get loads of them, um, that they've just colonised the area um, because man's just interfered with it. So it's not it's not part of an ancient woodland. Uh, the edible leaves of ransom can uh, be eaten in salads when they impart a garlic-like taste midway, bet midway between leek and garlic. Um, can be cooked as a vegetable. Both the bul bul bulbs and the flowers. Um, are very, very tasty. Ransoms grow in shady hedgerows of, of moist deciduous woodlands um, and, and usually like growing in, in areas that have been extensively disturbed. Um, again, we've mentioned the um, hedges there as well. Right, nettles. We can't do this without doing nettles, can we? No, we can't. So in the dying echelons of this lecture for the past 20 minutes, I'll have a very strong Welsh accent, like... No, he won't, because John will storm out. Have you noticed John only comes about once a month because it takes a month for him yeah, to recover? It's the sound of sediment, isn't it, nettles? Nettles? What's that, John? The thing is, the trash force is not the tail, I've finished my first time. I'm a wicked week, I'm going to laugh at the She says, where have I been? I said, well, it was so enjoyable, we couldn't leave. Right. <laughs> Right, John, I promise next time you come, we, we'll, we'll try and finish closer to our past. All right? So don't worry. Easy, you have no go at me. It's terrible. Terrible. Has he got a very... Yeah, you, you take ages to make the tea. This is all being recorded, by the way. Right, anyway, nettles. Nettles. Oh, for... 
necklace. This is why this goes on for never, right? Um, so, from William Shakespeare, you touch the hokey pokey and you turn around. That is! You touch, you touch the hokey pokey and you turn around was actually in William Shakespeare. Okay? Um, yield stinging nettles to mine enemies and when they from thy bosom pluck a flower, guard it, I pray thee, with a lurking adder. Whatever. But anyway, the point is that the nettle is part of our human, a part of our human consciousness. Okay, it's it's it can be found in in a hedgerow, woodlands. Is to be seen in tradition and folklore. And one point, I one point I wanted to make, and this is a really really important point. Um, woodlands themselves, if they have survived to a large degree, have been allowed to survive. Or reasons that we've mentioned, i.e. they're good for grazing pigs and maybe some of our other beasties. And actually, woodlands are really useful for plants to grow so that medicines can be put together. And one of those in particular is the nettle. Nettles usually grow in areas that have been extensively disturbed. And we want to move on a little bit. It's said here, um, in historical terms, the nettle has been used since prehistoric times. A fabric woven from nettle has been discovered in a Bronze Age tomb in Denmark. It is likely that the plant had been used earlier than the Bronze Age. Certainly twine made from the stalk has been found in Neolithic contexts. Um... It says here, I have watched nettle twine being made, and once you have the knack of losing the leaves without getting stung, it is a fast and easy way to make a very strong twine. Hence, the hokey pokey. So if, you, if you're stung by it, you have a reaction. Various sources have suggested that the nettle was introduced into this country by the Romans, who used it as a means of keeping warm in the cold climate of Britain. And I couldn't believe this when I read this. How? Simply keeping, keep drawing the nettle across your skin uh, to get the stinging and burning sensation which would keep you warm. Well, hang on, have you ever done that, Michael? The, the Red Indian runners were supposed to have beaten their legs with stinging nettles to make, so they could run fast. Really? To increase blood flow. Would that, would that be classed as cheating? <laughs> Um, they're going to ban stinging nettles from the Olympics now. It is also thought that this was a curative for rheumatism. Before leaving the world of archaeology, there is one other benefit than nettle. Clumps of nettles can often indicate former areas of occupation and farm building are uh, used to house livestock. Um, before we go on to this nice little tree, before we end... Um, as, a, as an archaeologist, I, I have... You often go into fields in, in the middle of nowhere, right? The, the, the landscape's been ploughed and then it's just um, laid over to, for pasture, right? But occasionally in that field, you could just get clumps of nettles from, from nowhere. Nettles usually grow um, on rocky ground, disturbed ground, where, where there's been some human context. And also, nettles like to grow really high and really prominent in areas where the ground is full of phosphates and nitrogen, where there's, where there's rotting material, material under the ground, no doubt disturbed, human cesspits, yeah. areas where animals have been buried after being slaughtered. So nettles are a sure sign that there's human activity. And even to the extent, if you get the right light, and you can maybe do aerial photography, or you just get the right light, you can work out the outline of buildings, where around the out, outside of the building, where the wall is, underneath the surface, the nettles will be a lighter colour. Um, there'll be a much deeper green colour within the interior of the building, okay? 
because um, there's going to be depressions, there's going to be the half and all the rest of it. So you can work out perfect outlines of buildings by looking at nettles. This is something that I may have mentioned before, okay? And before we actually go into just mentioning, we've got a wonderful oak tree behind us. And this is, this is really important stuff. Wherever you go into woodlands um, and you think, oh, I've got an ancient woodland, if ever you see an alignment of a certain type of tree, right? I know it sounds obvious, but that, again, is either an alignment of a hedgerow that's become mature and then it's been completely planted with trees, or that hedge line itself indicates a field boundary, or that hedge line itself indicates an old lane of some description, okay? Wherever you see alignments of trees, it's not a natural phenomenon. They've been deliberately planted. Go on. Another thing, I have a big oak in the corner of my land in France, and the predominant wind is southwesterly, yeah. and all the acorns come down to the east, or northeast, and they're all growing. Two you, meters, you want all the time, all the time. Can you ever bring, can you, next time you go over, can you bring me some acorns back so I can plant some? Yeah. Yeah? And sweet chestnuts. Um, not too much on the sweet chestnuts, but get, bring one or, one or two of them back, yeah. Because I do, I like planting trees. Um, anyway, this is is a nice chunky oak tree. Come on, it's not a sea sal, it's a... Open land. Pug What's that? That's grown in open land. Now that is really important, right? But I'm not being patronising there. That is a really, really important point. And why is it an important point? Well, I've been to um, I've been to Savannah Forest, right? And in Savannah Forest, got to write this down to remind me. In Savannah Forest, there's there's um, there's names for some of the oak trees. There's 50 really ancient oak trees in Britain over a thousand years old. And these, these oak trees are massive, okay? They're huge. In the middle of a woodland, right? Did you notice I didn't use the word ancient, right? So you've got these massive trees, right? And the reason why they're massive, like this one, is because initially they were being grown by themselves. They've just been left, or they're just growing by themselves. And then suddenly, over the years, right, that woodland itself is no longer being used to graze deer or for the deer to be hunted at Savanac Forest. In fact, Savanac Forest should be called a woodland because it's deciduous trees, okay? But the name is forest. So in Savanac, you, you've got this really massive oak alongside the side of the road. And there are a few other big oak trees there, but most of the trees are fairly young. And that indicates that those trees grew alone once, okay? Those big old oaks, out in the oak open like this. So what's happened is this is probably part of the ancient woodland. And what's happened is the humans have decided to move from ploughing the landscape or the hunting of deer, which needs open spaces, and loads of trees have been planted there. There's also something else that I'm not really sure you're going to find in a book. When I, do, when I do these classes, I mainly, occasionally make the odd discovery at the end of presenting it four or five times, no, five or six times. And one of the little discoveries I realised was you might get a really massive oak tree or an elm tree growing alongside the side of a road. And why? Because when you usually got a road, it's got no competition on one side and it's growing really powerful and big alongside that road. Because there's a road there, because it's got no competition. And I actually started thinking this, right? And I actually started to think, well, if you've got a really old yew, or a really old oak, and you're looking for a Roman road, and you get one or two in alignments, that might be an indication that they're being grown alongside a road and it had no competition. And it was able to grow big because that road was used for a little length of time and then suddenly the road was abandoned and that might be a sure sign that they were once alongside a road that is no longer there today. I was um, I was in a field not so long ago and, and I'm sure Martin heard this 
um, it's in the bill like a Morgan, and it was an ash tree, um, and there was a there was these earthworks of a prehistoric site, and in the corner of this circle, well, I don't know if you can have a corner in the circle, but you know what I'm trying to say. In one side, there was a nice old ash tree. Ash trees usually grow up up like this when they're in woodland, but this old ash tree was growing out. And I was looking at this and thinking, this is absolutely fascinating. What's going on here? And 200 metres over there, there was a woodland. And you could see all the birch trees and all the other trees growing up really thin and just growing up to try and get to the light. And I actually looked at this tree and I said, you've never, had to, you've never needed to compete, have you? This is why you as an ash tree have grown out this way. So three, four hundred years ago, this was a really old ash, maybe maximum about three hundred. I can't remember the date on it, but anyway. Um, so we know now know that that field has been ploughed in that area for over three hundred years because that tree has had no competition. That's what you can learn. So, so if anyone ever says, "Oh, how long have they been ploughing this field? They've been ploughing this field for three hundred bloody years. How long have they been ploughing this field? Right? It's going this way, right?" That's a really old oak tree. They've been ploughing that field for over 500 years, and that's the proof of it. That's great, isn't it? You could learn that just from a tree. And look, look at this next one now. This is my yew tree. In Wales, we've got loads of um, we've got loads of great graveyards in Wales, um, and in lots of them you get the yew tree. And the yew tree is a nice tree. I like the yew tree for many angles, but one point to be made is that the reason why yew trees grow the way they do, because they've got no competition. They're, they don't need to compete with the graves. In fact, I've seen yew trees where you get the graves being taken up in the roots of the, of the yew tree. It's really weird when that happens. But again, this yew tree has been... But there's another point to be made here. I've just suddenly realised in these little grey cells. Okay, The other point to be made is that they always say that the yew tree is a sign of an earlier site, okay? And then the Christians come and build their site, right? For worship. But there's something a little bit more deeper than that. Maybe this yew tree has been alone. Give or take religions has been alone for a very long time. And it's 3,000 years old because it's had no competition and whenever you hear, hear the word lonely old oak or young, lonely old yew tree, because they are that very, very lonely. Also, about a thousand years older. Yes, older much than older than, yes, exactly. Lived the outside. Exactly. The exactly, exactly. There you go, one of, one of those woodlands that just grow up. You can tell that that's fairly new because it's just one variety and wherever you get an old woodland right you've usually got um, old species and new species growing and it's it's been managed as I mentioned earlier on um, and I'm not saying you should get a pet pig Brian but that would help a, what? a pet pig in your woodland oh, right. yes, I tell you, also, <laughs> you have the odd goat wandering around could you Joe, you know, I, I used to have two goats, right? Nightmare. They, used to, they, they, they would do anything to get inside the house and on the roof. Um, anyway, uh, this, this is again an old hollow medieval way, flanked with trees either side. Um, and there is, going back to something I've mentioned earlier on, you can find old railway tracks, railway cuttings, roadways, um, inclines to mining industrial landscapes. And what you might see is you see really big old trees, okay, and along in the middle you see smaller trees, okay. They like to grow in the middle because it's no longer used and the, the big trees ain't growing there. So along that route and you follow them and obviously you've got the route where you've been looking for. Um, and just, just a few things. Um, finally, um, it's mentioned a load of different uh, processes of, of, um, of being in a woodland. Hang on. And I think this point, 
most people assume that our oak wood, beech woods and other woods of our other native trees are all an old and natural part of the countryside. But this is a long way from the truth. Natural woods completely untouched by man no longer exist in Britain. That's wrong. But mainly no longer exist in Britain. Many of our woods are young, perhaps only a few centuries old, and even our older woods were in almost all cases used or managed in past centuries. A great deal can be learned about the history of a wood by looking for signs of past management, indicating if they've got some level of past management, okay, the trees have remained there, but they've been managed, and you've got all the other species, so that's really, really important. I didn't want to do any more more there than that, but I wanted to mention that um, I know of one or two ancient woodlands in Britain, and I'll tell you of one now. Um, Hoy, on the island of Hoy in Orkney, it's an isolated island of the um, Orkney archipelago. When I say isolated, you can't exactly walk over there. You've got to get a regular ferry. And in the middle of nowhere, you've got to drive some distance and you've got to walk some distance as a wood and a little cleft um, which leads out into a valley you've got these birch trees um, and, a f and you've got rowan and a few old trees in there right and to get there one mile takes you two hours to walk there it, it's really difficult and when I got there guess what I saw inside the woodland I saw a load of species of trees on the ground with the mosses and fungus and amongst them were some natural species of plants and then were the odd, the odd shrubs and then the more dominant trees they were quite small but it was an old woodland I have seen one and touched this woodland and been touched myself to see something very very ancient so they do exist um, and one thing I one thing I finished with um, when I've done this, I've mentioned that if ever you go into a woodland and you see something known as a midland hawthorn, which is slightly different from um, a normal hawthorn, you can see that the, the leaves here um, have got spacing, but these ones have not got spacing. Okay? If you ever see a midland hawthorn, it's a sign that the woodland you're looking at is very, very ancient. Um, and just quickly, I, I mentioned this. Um, there are 36 um, native British trees, 35 it says here, but, um, and it says, um, let's just quickly go, there's the aspen, loves water, willow, bay willow loves water, a bird cherry, uh, black poplar, quite a tall tree, box tree, quite a small tree, um, common alder, also common ash, beech, and pear and yew. Um, crab apple, that's a native British variety. Crack willow, you've got your downy birch, your field maple with those wonderful leaves. Goat willow, grey poplar, grey willow, your hawthorn, hazel and holly, your wonderful old holly, your hornbeam, juniper berries, juniper, midland hawthorn, I mentioned that, pendunculate oak, um, you've got your sesal oak. Your rowan, your only um, fully evergreen tree, which is your conifer, even though um, you is also evergreen. Um, your, your proper sort of um, a pine tree, your Scots pine, that's the only one we've got native to the country. Silver birch, small leaf lime, other than the big leaves that they used to plant alongside the, the roads um, in Britain. Strawberry tree, white bean, white willow, a wild cherry, service tree. If you ever see a service tree, let me know. I will be there like a shot. Um, and a witch elm. Hornbeam. Hornbeam, I mentioned that, yeah. Yeah. So those are the 35 varieties of common native tree. There's a 36th one, but that'll just confuse matters. Are there any questions? I'm going to tell you what we're going to do next week. Um, we're going to look at the Zaza Gabor collection of jewellery. Next week, we're going to be looking at two ro uh, wonderful Roman villas. One, in Lant one from Lantwick Major, 
and one from over the border in England. It's about time we did some Roman stuff. Even though we don't have any Roman villas around here, it'd be good to actually look at them. Um, so that's what we're doing next week. Any questions? And if you come next week, I'll bring Yak's milk. No more questions? Thank you very much, boys and girls. And a partridge in a pear tree. No, no Yak's milk as well then. Uh, cheese, I mean. Yak's cheese. Anyway, thank you very much. I'll see you all next week. It's all gone quiet. Yeah, yeah. I was more interested yeah, in than I thought. Good. I did a lot good. of forestry. Good. If somebody could do the light.